Well, hello, Nativity Bible Heads. It is Dr. Wayne, and it is time for Bible Study Wednesday on June the 9th. We are in the last chapter of 1 Kings and the first chapter of 2 Kings today. The uh, place where we left off was um, at the death of King Ahab um, in 1 Kings uh, chapter uh, 22, verse 40. Remember, the divisions between uh, the books of the Kings and also the books of Samuel uh, it was, it was arbitrary. Um, and there still are just one book each in the, uh, in the uh, Hebrew canon, uh, but uh, they got divided up uh, where we are. So the division line um, from the end of the book of First Kings and the beginning of the book of Second Kings is, is arbitrary, and it didn't really fit. So uh, today we're going to cover the last uh, 22 or verses, 23 verses of, uh, uh, 13 verses of uh, chapter uh, of First Kings, and we're going to cover the first chapter of Second Kings. Remember, Ahab was a bad guy, okay? And when he died, um, we'd already been told that he uh, wasn't going to have a dynasty. Uh, he was made this very clear. Remember his um, troubler uh, prophet was Elijah, right? Well, we're going to see Elijah uh, reappear in this section. But um, as is the method of our narrator, he flip-flops back and forth from uh, one, the king of Judah to the king of Israel. We haven't heard about the king of Judah in a long time. Uh, he got reintroduced in uh, chapter 22 earlier uh, when uh, he and Ahab went to uh, fight uh, at Ramot Gilead, which is where um, when Ahab uh, took that, he took that shot that killed him. Not a shot, it was, an, I think it was an arrow, actually. Um, verse 41, Jehoshaphat, son of Asa, began to reign over Judah in the fourth year of King Ahab of Israel. So this is really backing up, right? Um, it would have been easier had our narrator decided to do the all the kings of Israel and then all the kings of Judah. <laughs> Didn't do it that way. I'd like to flip back and forth. So um, it was in the fourth year of Ahab of Israel that Jehoshaphat came to be king, right? Um, and if you remember where it says, when it says, mentions Jehoshaphat, son of Asa, if you remember, Asa was a good king. Asa was a good king in Judah. And uh, Jehoshaphat, um, well, let's see how he, he does, verse 42. Jehoshaphat was 35 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 25 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Azubah, daughter, daughter of Shili, Shalihi, Shalihi. Now, or is it Shilhi? I can't tell. Is there an extra eye? Daughter of Shilhi. We get the mother's name of the Judean kings, but we don't get the mother's name of the northern kingdom kings, which gives us a clue that this narrator is uh, southern kingdom Judah, uh, you know, interested most. Verse 43, he walked in all the ways of his father Asa. He did not turn aside from it doing what was right in the sight of the Lord. Remember, um, Asa was one of those good kings. This is that line of David, if you will, uh, being continued. He has a couple of the things though. Yet, the high places were not taken away. What were high places? High places were any place where there was worship being done. And it wasn't necessarily pagan worship or Baal worship even. It was just worship that was not done. It, it was outside of Jerusalem, the high places. Um, Remember, one of the feats of David that is lauded by our narrator, especially in the book of Samuel, is his elimination of the high places or his um, centralization of worship in Jerusalem. And not everybody was as stringent about that in his lineage. And apparently, even though, Ahab, even though Asa was a good king, Jehoshaphat was a good king, but he still... He still didn't stop that practice, and our narrator is keen to point that out. And the people still sacrificed and offered incense on the high places. 
Verse 44, Jehoshaphat also made peace with the king of Israel. This may be a reference to uh, that uh, scene we saw at the beginning of chapter 22 when Jehoshaphat goes to Ahab and they go to Ramot Gilead, uh, attack it together. Um, when it says made peace with, it could be a way of saying he was a little bit a vassal of. So to make peace with means that they didn't get taken over by. So it could actually refer to a state of vassalage, V-A-S-S-A-L. Verse 45, now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat and his power that he showed and how he waged war, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? Remember, frequently our narrator refers us to go to the library if you want all the stories. I'm not giving you all the stories. I'm giving you what I'm giving you to convey a word from the Lord. Hence, we know that history is not the telling of, uh, or, or the, the Bible is not history in the way we think, think of history today. Verse 46, the remnant of the male temple prostitutes who were still in the land in the days of his father Asa, he exterminated. Oh, so um, uh, even though Jehoshaphat, um, you know, didn't do, he didn't do, he didn't take away the high places, but he did eliminate the temple prostitutes. And that was, those were uh, for, I don't know, this is what I don't know. I don't know if that's a reference to the temple in Jerusalem. Um, it probably is, because um, I don't know of any other, it probably was, um, which is interesting to ask. It's like, so it's key to notice here that worship practices of the fertility cults around had started to creep in. And I think that's what this is referenced to, even in the Yahwistic religion cult stuff in, uh, in Jerusalem. Verse 47, there was no king in Edom, a deputy was king. Edom, if you remember, if you're looking at a map of, the, of Israel, you see the Dead Sea just to the right, oh, not just the right, but uh, just seriously, right below the Dead Sea all the way down to the Gulf of, I think it's the Gulf of Suez, um, is where you'll find uh, Edom. Here's the thing about Edom. Edom has shoreline. Uh, Edom is a pathway to the sea. Keep that in mind. Jehoshaphat made ships of the Tarshish type. Oh, it's Tarshish type. What does that mean? Well, it could mean, uh, it could be referring to Tarsus, uh, which is where Paul was from in southern Turkey, or it could be a reference to Tarsus, um, which is a port of Spain. Um, but whatever type, it's the type of ship that was uh, a, a high seas vessel that would go on long journeys uh, for goods, okay? Jehoshaphat made ships of the Tarshish type to go to Ophir for gold. We don't know exactly where Ophir is. We think that it might be the Philippines. This is a tradition that we have. Uh, we don't have uh, unequivocal uh, evidence for this, but it, it could mean the Philippines, Ophir. Uh, this is the same place that we're told that uh, Solomon had gone for his gold. Um, but they did not go, for the ships were wrecked at Itzion Geber. Now, if you're looking at a map, Itzion Geber is at that southern tip. It's a shore city uh, at the bottom tip of, uh, or if you look at the, you know how the Sinai Peninsula goes down and then up? Well, there's a, there's a, uh, a place where the, uh, the Dead Sea, the inlet for the Dead Sea, basically, uh, from the Gulf of Suez, that's where Itzion Geber is. It was, it was uh, Solomon had used it as well for his ships. Verse 49, then Ahaziah, son of Ahab, said to Jehoshaphat, wait a second, didn't, yeah, exactly. Well, um, we're still talking about Jehoshaphat, right? Um, as long as he's not dead, until he says he's dead, we're not done talking about him. Jehoshaphat made ships, da, 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 da. then Ahaziah, son of Ahab, said to Jehoshaphat, let my servants go with your servants to the ships. But Jehoshaphat was not willing. Um, 
don't know exactly what this is about other than um, a key that, okay, the kingship of uh, Ahaziah, son of Ahab, it was uh, two years, it was actually less than two years. Um, it was a, a, crippling, a crippled kind of a, 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 a dynasty. And um, the fact that Jehoshaphat wasn't willing to mingle with him might be a part of his perception of being in the right, uh, according to our narrator. Verse 50, Jehoshaphat slept with his ancestors and was buried with his ancestors in the city of his father David. His son Jehoram succeeded him. Okay, so we're not gonna get much on Jehoram now, but uh, we are gonna get a little bit more on this Ahaziah, the son of Ahab. Remember, um, we've already been told that Ahab's line will die out, uh, and it does die out in this generation. Uh, there will be no son of Ahaziah to, to go to the throne. Ahaziah, son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel in Samaria in the 17th year of King Jehoshaphat of Judah. Um, he reigned two years over Israel. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and mother. Who is his mother? Jezebel. That's right. Ahab's wife, Jezebel, was the mother. He, our narrator doesn't even want to say the name of Jezebel anymore. And in the way of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin. Remember, Jeroboam was that, that, was that uh, I think it was the grandfather of Ahab, uh, father of Omri, who had initiated the problems with um, the, um, uh, the, the sanctuaries to Baal at the northern and southern part and allowing all the Baal worship. That's the sin of Jeroboam. And it continued all the way through the end of the, uh, that, the Omride dynasty. That's Omri. Omri was Ahab's father, and they continued that practice. He did what was evil and said, Lord, da, 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 and in the way of Jeroboam, son of Nehemiah, who caused Jehoshaphat with sins. Last verse of chapter 22 of 1 Kings. He served Baal and worshiped him. <laughs> he provoked the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger, just as his father had done. Thus ends the reign of Ahaziah. Flipping the page, remember the, this is an artificial division between the two books. Verse one of chapter one of 2 Kings. After the death of Ahab, Moab rebelled against Israel. So Edom and Moab, we just got mentioned Edom and um, Edom was down that uh, south of Moab. Moab was that country just to the east of the Dead Sea, um, present day, you know, southern Jordan. And whenever there's rebellion, it creates opportunity for something. Let's see what this is. Verse two, 2 Kings 1, verse two. Ahaziah had fallen through the lattice in his upper chamber in Samaria and lay injured, so he sent messengers. So, so these are the last, this is the last of, the, of, of the, that dynasty, of the Amorite dynasty dying out, where King Ahab and Ahaziah, and now we have this king who's basically an invalid, if you will. He hasn't recovered, so uh, we don't think that, um, we don't have a whole lot of hope for Ahaziah. But what does he do? So he sent messengers telling him, go inquire of Baal Zebub. Oh, Baal Zebub, Baal Zebub. What does that literally mean, Lord of the Flies? Um, uh, the God of Ekron, whether I shall re require or recover from this injury. So what, Baal, the word Baal literally means Lord. Um, Baalzebub refers to, uh, that literally means Lord of the flies. One of the things that the prophets of Baal would do was, uh, you, have you ever seen a swarm of flies, okay? And there's a buzzing noise. They claimed they could uh, glean a word of God from their Baal god, from this buzzing uh, uh, swarm of flies. Uh, hence the way it sounds, Lord of the Flies, Beelzebub, zzz, right? Um, so it's a foreign god, god of Ekron. Ekron, if you, uh, and I was paying attention in my uh, Old Testament history, or Old Testament geography class, um, Ekron is one of those um, Philistine cities on the, on the coast. Uh, 
one of those uh, cities that uh, wasn't under the control of Israel, was always uh, a pagan. Uh, whether I shall recover from this injury. So he's wanting a word from the Baal prophets about, am I going to die from this? But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, oh, bum, 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 enter Elijah. We haven't heard from Elijah in a while, but all of a sudden the scene shifts. Okay, as I had just told them, oh, go to Baalzebub in, uh, in Ekron and find out if a word from the Lord, and now the scene shifts. Elijah. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, the Tishbite. Remember Tishbe? Well, if, you're from, if you're from Tishbe, you're a Tishbite. Get up. Go to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and say to them, is it because there is no God in Israel that you're going to inquire of Baal, Zebub, the god of Ekron? It's kind of a smarmy way of saying it. <laughs> of saying, why are you doing this? Is it because there are no gods? Is that why? It's really kind of a biting, kind of a sarcastic way of saying it. Now therefore, thus says the Lord, you shall not leave the bed to which you have gone, but you shall surely die. So this is the message that the angel gave to Elijah. So Elijah went. The messengers returned to the king. This is King Ahaziah, the one who'd fallen through the lattice, Ahab's son, who said to them, why have you returned? And they answered him, well, there came a man to meet us who said to us, okay, so what had happened here is that Elijah had gone to and intercepted the messengers from Ahaziah that were going to Ekron for Baalzebub, uh, reading, right? And now they are recounting to Ahaziah why they didn't actually make it to Ekron. Elijah had intercepted them. The messengers returned to the king who said to them, why have you returned? They answered him, there came a man to meet us who said to us, go back to the king who sent you and say to him, thus says the Lord, is it because there is no God in Israel that you are sending to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore, you shall not leave the bed to which you have gone, but shall surely die. So they're quoting what Elijah had told them to Ahaziah. He said to them, what sort of man was he who came to meet you and told you these things? It's like, what did this guy look like? They answered him, a hairy man. Uh, the word hairy man uh, is like... Uh, Literally, the word goes like a lord of the hair. Maybe it's a play on lord of the flies, Beelzebub, Beelzehari. <laughs> a hairy man with a leather belt around his waist. He said, it is Elijah, the Tishbite. Uh, so remember, Elijah was a troubler, a, a troubler of Israel per Ahab. And so Ahaziah would have to know who Elijah was uh, from that encounter. So um, yeah, he's saying, oh, great. He's back. Verse nine. Then the king sent to him a captain of 50. And with his 50, uh, a captain of 50, with his, with his 50 men, okay? The king, that's Ahaziah, sends to Elijah. Okay, Elijah's in his little uh, hilltop uh, place where prophets go. <laughs> he went up to Elijah, who was sitting on the top of a hill, and said to him, O man of God, the king says, come down. But Elijah answered the captain of 50, if I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. <laughs> wow, okay. Verse 11. Again, the king sent to him another captain of 50. With his 50, he went up and said to him, oh man of God, this is the king's order. Come down quickly. But Elijah answered him, if I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Remember uh, the big um, uh, uh, Elijah versus the prophets of Baal on the top of Mount Carmel and uh, they, uh, fire comes down from heaven and consumes everything. Um, 
So this is, uh, we, we totally expect this. And the Elijah narratives, if they've done nothing else, they've, they've taught us that when we read something like this, like, oh yeah, 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 that's, that's, that's how it happens when you deal with Elijah. <laughs> Verse 13, again, this is the third time, again, the king sent the captain of a third 50 with his 50. So the third captain of 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and entreated him, oh man of God, Please let my life and the life of these 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight. You see, he's heard about what happened to the other guys. Look, fire came down from heaven and consumed the two former captains of the 50 men with their 50s, but now let my life be precious in your sight. Then the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, go down with him, do not be afraid of him, so Elijah listens to the angel of the Lord again. So he set out and went down with him to the king, to, to Ahaziah, just like Ahaziah had wanted, verse 16, and said to him, notice he just, just it's like, okay, all right, I'm just gonna give you what you want, and here it is. Thus says the Lord, because you have sent messengers to inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, is it because there is no God in Israel to inquire of his word? This is really poking, just really being sarcastic. Really, you don't think that there's, uh, you're afraid to come to me? Or are you afraid you're just gonna get bad news? Is that what it's about? Do you really see that the God of Israel can't, uh, can't give you the truth? Or maybe if you don't, maybe you don't want the truth. Therefore, and here it is, you shall not leave the bed to which you have gone, but you shall surely die. And um, we don't have any evidence that he was even old enough to get married or got married even or had any. We know he didn't have any children because uh, his son doesn't take over, but um, he finally gets the word. Remember this all started with his accident of falling through the lattice in his upper chamber. And so this is the ignominious and, um, you know, sad end of the, the Amri dynasty that, uh, that Ahab uh, was, we, we, that we heard so much about the time when Ahab was, was king. This is his son, of course. Verse 17 so he died according to the word of the Lord that Elijah had spoken. His brother, Jehoram, notice this is his brother, because like I said, he obviously didn't have a son, didn't have any kids, probably, not, probably didn't even have a wife yet, we don't know, succeeded him as king in the second year of King Jehoram, same name, no relation, son of Jehoshaphat of Judah, because Ahaziah had no son. Now, the rest of the acts of Ahaziah that he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? Thus ends 2 Kings chapter one. This is the last of the big things that we're about to see, uh, that we're uh, seeing of the, of the deeds of Elijah. So one of the things that that we wanna key on that happens in 1 Kings is the rise of the prophets to uh, counterbalance or counteract the, the bad kings. Um, you know, we talk about Jesus as being in the role of prophet and priest and king. Back in the days of Israel, when they were at its worst, prophet, priest, king were nowhere of the same mind. Um, priest uh, started, the, pri the priesthood started to get really uh, decadent and um, uh, unfaithful and uh, uh, abusive of their power. Uh, the kings, same way, um, with especially uh, in, the, in, the, in the vein of, way, of what Samuel had said, your kings are not gonna be good for you. The kings are gonna ruin things for you. The kings are gonna be bad, horrible. So the prophet, a prophet arises so the arrival of the prophets, the, the arising of the prophets as a uh, counterbalance to the bad kings, this is a big part of what, um, of what 
the former prophets have to tell us. Remember, this section of the Hebrew Bible isn't called history in the tradition of, of the Hebrew Bible. It's called the former prophets. And I think it's because of the fact that it has these stories of the prophets uh, dealing with the kings and such with regard to correction and stuff. Um, uh, we're going to see more of this in, in the book of 2 Kings. But um, I think this is instructive when we start to see the nature of um, uh, who Jesus was. You know, one of the things that, uh, especially the nativity stories, are very keen on uh, building on is uh, Jesus as, as, as being in the line of David, you know, that whole kingship thing. Um, but yet, remember when Jesus asked his disciples, well, who do they, people say that I am? And sometimes people say, well, maybe some people think you're the prophet. And Elijah was thought of as to be one of those kinds of prophets that uh, he had it right. He had the word from the Lord. He had the counsel of God. There was no, yeah, the, the, yes, we, had, we saw the human side of Elijah uh, in, in some of his uh, uh, inner, inner uh, uh, angst and stuff. But when Jesus arises, uh, you know, centuries later, he takes on the mantle of Elijah. He takes on the mantle of, of Moses, the, 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 the premium priest of all time, um, and in the line of David, prophet, priest, king. This is one of the things that our New Testament writers were very, were very keen on making sure that we got this, that, oh, this is... Uh, everything that Israel ever needed and it's in one person and so Jesus goes forth and then he basically is the fulfillment of what God wanted with regard to a leader um, that's I believe the value of looking back at these kings uh, some people you know don't see a whole lot of value it's like well, why would you want to study all of that old stuff well I believe that it gives us a better picture of who Jesus was and the expectations around who Jesus was and how people may have responded to Jesus by their expectations built on what they knew of from their past. And this is what the early church crafted into all of our, what we have as our Christian doctrines today. So um, yes, that's the reason why I believe it's so valuable. So thank you for hanging in there with me. Uh, next week, we'll be in 2 Kings chapter two. So until then, peace.